Hi, it's Penny, and as usual, I'm here to talk about some bookish things. Specifically today, I wanted to talk about the last thousand pages of science fiction that I've read. So I've started a series recently where every time I read a thousand pages of a particular genre, I then stop in to give you guys a little bit more detailed reviews than I can manage to fit into my wrap-ups, because these days I'm reading like 20 books a month, and if I was to give my detailed thoughts about all of those books in a wrap-up, like how long would that even be? But today I do have five science fiction books that I want to talk to you about. And I'm going to talk about them from the one that I have the least to say about to the one that I have the most to say about. So the first book is the only one that I actually own physically and that is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. This is a really well known science fiction although it's also a bit of a comedy and even though I knew that going in it's almost the bit that disappointed me the most. When I was a teen I watched the BBC television series that was based on this book and at that time I loved it. I thought it was hilarious and a really interesting story. Unfortunately reading this I still think the story is interesting but a lot of the humor just wasn't quite doing it for me and I don't know if that's just because it's an older style of humor. When was this book even published? 1979, slightly older than me. So maybe it's just that the style of humor isn't really as funny as it used to be. It's also very British humor so I can see that a lot of people wouldn't like it but often I quite like British humor so I was surprised that I didn't. I think it's just that sometimes I felt like it was trying too hard to be funny instead of just being casually funny, you know, like, oh, oops, I was funny. And I think I was quite surprised how little of the story this one book gets through because there is a whole series and I believe the television series is based on the whole series because the beginning of this doesn't really tell you very much at all. So part of me wants to continue the series to see whether I get into it more, but I'm not sure because this was a bit of a slog to get through even though it's only 200 pages. Maybe I'll go back and watch the TV series and that'll motivate me to continue with this series. So I expect that most people will know what this story is about, but if you don't, basically the Earth is about to be destroyed in order to build an intergalactic highway. But luckily there is an alien on Earth and he manages to escape with one of the humans and they go out and kind of explore the galaxy by hitchhiking around. So the next book I want to talk about is Want by Cindy Pond. So this is the first book in a duology that was released a couple of years ago and it is set in this dystopian future in Taipei where the pollution has gotten really bad and there are also two classes of people. There are the richer people who have these suits that protect them from the pollution and are kind of quite spoiled brats, essentially the one percenters of today, and then there are the poorer people who live in poverty. They are always getting sick because of all the pollution and also a lack of access to medical facilities and medical care. And the main character we follow is one of these. He has a group of friends that he's working with. They're trying to lobby the government to make changes to improve the environmental situation, and they come up with a Scheme that involves kidnapping to try and set things right. I thought that the issues this book investigated were really interesting so we've got the environmental issues and the effect that is having on the world as well as this inequality between the haves and the wants. Of course both these issues are very relevant in our current present and I think it did a good job of showing what the world might be like if we don't make some changes. That said, I really found it hard to connect with the characters, especially the main character is this boy and he very quickly gets into this girl and you know how I feel about romance. I don't like it. Also he was just thinking like stereotypical boy stuff and like I don't care. How about we pay attention to the actual important issues that are going on at the moment. And also related to that romance there was a reveal near the end that I just it could have been done in a much better way. I don't know what better way but the way it was done didn't feel like it had the impact it was trying to have. Also the main character has this group of friends and there were really not that many of them I think just like four of them uh, and the love interest also has a group of friends and there were just so many side characters and they only have very small parts in the story so I kept forgetting who was who and there's a part where something happens to some of those and you're meant to feel very emotional about it and I was still just like yeah but who are these people again? So overall I gave this three stars because I thought it was an okay read. I really liked some of the concepts and the ideas that were being explored but I just couldn't connect with the characters and I didn't care much about the outcome. So next I'm going to talk about 
two audiobooks I listened to from the same series, both of which I gave four stars, although I did find that I enjoyed the second one better, and that is the first two books of The Themis Files, so Sleeping Giants and Waking Gods, both by Sylvain Nouvelle. So this series is told through a bunch of different interview transcripts and files, hence the name of the series, The Themis Files, and we start by following this young girl who is riding her bike through the forest and she falls into a hole and discovers that she's fallen onto a giant hand and then when she's older she's involved with the scientific group that are studying this hand and trying to work out where it came from because it doesn't seem from the metal that it's made of that it could have come from earth. Now especially in Sleeping Giants I did find the format a little bit difficult to get into because we're always being told things through interviews, we're never in the present action. Or sometimes they manage to do it so like someone's being interviewed as they're doing something or they're recording someone as they're doing something. But there is one particular scene where things are very emotional and we only hear about it after the fact. And for me, that made that whole scene kind of lose its emotional impact. And also the audiobook is a full cast, so all the different characters are voiced by different actors, but I still found that sometimes I found two of the main female characters quite uh, confusing, as in who is talking. If I wasn't paying attention, I'd be like, is this Kara or Rose? I don't remember. But I think in the second book, because I was a little bit more used to it, I was able to identify their voices better, so I got over that. And I think just in general I got used to the format. And maybe in the second book he did a little bit better in terms of finding ways to be in the present action rather than only hearing about it after the fact. So the second book kind of builds in intensity and we're getting much more involved on a bigger scale. It's hard to talk about without spoilers but the series gets quite extreme. I'm very excited about reading the third book in the series. That said, I do have a few other criticisms. Uh, firstly, there is in the second book a torture scene uh, where listening to the audiobook you have to actually listen to someone being tortured and like screaming and begging people to stop. I think that was completely unnecessary. I had to stop it halfway through because I just honestly didn't want to listen to it. So. If you want to skip that scene when you get to it, like feel free to. It adds nothing to the story. And it was just uncool, unnecessary. Also, one of the female characters who does some quite questionable things and is quite an unlikable character has a stutter. And it was kind of cool, like, that a stutter was included into the audiobook, except for the fact that she was the unlikable character. And it if you're gonna do like cool unusual representation of someone with like a, a speech impediment I don't think you should make them the unlikable character. It's almost like you're saying oh this woman's bad because she can't speak properly. I don't like that. Also there were a few bits where it got into quite long and in-depth explanations of the genetics of certain things and honestly I don't care that much about genetics. I understand that the author was trying to explain the logic of certain things to you, but honestly I was willing to take the genetics of the situation based on what the character who was an expert in this field said. I didn't need to understand it that much myself. So I feel like I see lots of negative stuff, but I honestly I really did love this series. It gets so epic. There are some really great characters, especially again in the second book. I really loved Eugene. This general who's in charge of a certain group that you're working with. Uh, there's also this young girl called Eva who I thought was really lovely and even some of the other characters like Kara and Vincent are growing on me. I will say there is a character, maybe even a couple, who die in this book and I just I don't accept it. I don't want to believe that they're dead so I don't. I, I don't believe they're dead. I do think if you like science fiction with robots and genetics and conflict at a planetary scale then this would be a good series for you. Then lastly we're going to talk about The Light Brigade by Cameron Hurley. I picked this up because I really love the Beldame Apocrypha series by Cameron Hurley. I love how gory and gritty and dark it is. So The Light Brigade is another dystopian future. In this case it's one where the world is run by these six main corporations and they're really focused on profits. People are very undervalued. At the same time we also have people living on Mars except that they get called Martians and the corporations are at war with the Martians. Within this world we follow our main character who 
One interesting aspect of the story was you don't learn their gender for about three quarters of the book. I will say like I found this really interesting. I got about three chapters in and I was like, hang on, what's the gender of this person? Because I was trying to picture them in my head and I couldn't quite do it. And then I realized I hadn't even been told. So I was really interested to see how the story would use that. But then when it was eventually revealed, it was revealed in quite a lackluster way. And I don't necessarily feel like it added anything to the story. In fact, it almost hindered it because when I was trying to picture this person in my head, I couldn't picture them because I didn't know. Is it a man or a woman or something else? I don't know. And because it's all set in this army where it's really brutal and physical. I felt like to me gender would have made a difference but I can kind of see that it's interesting to make you think about is that true? Yeah I don't know how I feel about that aspect of the story but regardless we follow this main character who is in one of the lower classes because they're not an official like citizen because they don't belong to a corporation. You can't become a citizen or a resident unless you belong to the corporation. Um, because of what's happened in the war, some of their family has died off and so they decide they want to fight in the war to try and sort things out. So they join the army and there's quite a lot of time spent in the build up to this and then the training of them being to the army. And the reason why I picked this up is because I was told that there is some aspect of time travel. But it isn't until they actually get through all their army training, which is about halfway through the book, that we stumble across some time travel. So so that was disappointing for me. Also once we got into the time travel I was really disappointed with how it played out. There's one part where some of the other characters who know this person can time travel say you know why don't you do something to try and fix things in the future because you know this horrible outcome is going to happen and they say I am trying to do something and reading it I was like are you? Because I haven't read anything that tells me you're trying to fix things. You just seem to be like oops I've time traveled again, oops I've time traveled again. I guess I just wanted the main character to take a bit more ownership of their journey and their time travel experience. And then in the end when it's kind of revealed what's going on with the time travel I thought that it would be something that would make it all click and I would understand how it all fit together but instead it was like oh that's what happened okay sure uh, there were a lot of hints throughout but I just didn't feel like they were clear enough maybe I'm just stupid but I felt like so much more could have been done with this quite unique time travel concept in the end I just don't feel like much happened the other complaint that I have about this is about all the the kind of complaints that corporations have ruined the world by what they're doing and I totally understand that this is very similar to what's happening but I always try to remember that corporations are just made up of people and yes sometimes the way the system currently is it does encourage people to do things that aren't very good but we made up the system. Humanity made up the system. So we can change the system. So at the end of the day it's people, the people who create these systems that are responsible for the bad shit. Not corporations, some kind of like mythological concept. So I sometimes think when people focus on corporations being evil that it's really just stopping people from thinking about the fact that some people are doing evil things and we could fix that or at least some of us could fix that and maybe that's what I really missed is that I didn't feel like there was a message of hope within this book. I always think whenever I go into a dystopian I really like seeing how awful things could get but I want that message of hope, the fact that we could dig ourselves out of it. So I think Cameron Hurley did a really good job of making the army training really realistic and the, the war and the fighting was really realistic. The whole world in general that she has created seemed really realistic but I think she was just quite weak on plot which is a criticism I've heard of her work before. There certainly was a plot, it just didn't really seem to go anywhere and so in the end I was quite unsatisfied which was disappointing because I was really excited for this book mainly because it told me it was going to have time travel and it did but mm. so I think if you really think corporations are the villain in this world and you want to get on a big like fuck the corporations uh, bandwagon then you will really like this book. 
I think if you're looking for really cool tricksy time travel, maybe not. It is still an interesting time travel concept, so you might want to read it, but just don't expect it to be too amazing. Okay, so I think I've been talking for way too long. So those are the last 1,000 pages of science fiction that I have read. If you have read any of these books, I would love to talk to you about them down in the comments. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you're having a wonderful day, and I will see you next time.